So, welcome, Lily, to Raw and Cook Vegan. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, and uh, and Lily, would, I'll, I'll just refer to you as Lily throughout the program, unless you want to do your full name. That's up to you. Okay. No, no, that's fine. Okay. And um, the way I usually start these, Lily, is if you could tell us a little bit about how you were raised and what your family thought about nutrition, diet, fitness, that sort of thing. Okay. So um, I, um, I live in London now, but I grew up in Northern California um, in the Redwoods, like in the country. Okay. Um, and my parents were hippies, so I think that very little that we did was standard. <laughs> um, um, and like my, my mom was really interested in, in nutrition. Um, so, you know, she was like very into like vegetables and organic and we had a garden and things like that. Um, right. But um, we weren't vegetarian, which looking back on it like seems odd to me because that just seems kind of like the obvious progression. Um, but we, we weren't vegetarian. So um, I don't ever remember either of my parents really cooking. <laughs> like, so we didn't do things like like eat dinner together at the same time or anything like that. So I just kind of remember individual things that like, you know, that I used to have like um, sweet potatoes, potatoes, um, salad, mochi. We, um, that was like kind of one of, <laughs> one of my staples. Um, mochi? Yeah, mochi. Um, you know, you know the, um, um, it's like, um, it's Japanese. It's like blocks of um, like pounded like glutinous rice or I don't know what it is, sweet rice or something and it and like it, it um, okay. it's like a brick and then you put it in the oven and it like kind of puffs up. Um, huh. Interesting. So yeah, it's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the brain, the, the grain, the, the brain, the, the, the brand that, um, that I used to have when I was a kid is, I think it's from California, it's called Renaissance um, and it's really good so I still huh. recommend mochi now. Um, but like we also had like um, chicken, like chicken soup and um, you know, like turkey hot dogs and, and things like that. Um, so I mean, the interesting thing is that um, my mom was, was very anti-dairy and so she thought that she herself was allergic to dairy um, which okay. I mean now I think like everyone is <laughs> or, or you know should be allergic to dairy um, and so yeah. we didn't ever like have milk or anything like that in the house but I was allowed to eat milk products even though my mom was against it because my dad thought that it would be like unfair to you know kind of Deprived me of something, yeah. That like, yeah, he thought was was normal. Yeah. Um, so, um, it, yeah. So that was that was kind of, I, I guess, when I was a kid, that was probably not like really standard anything. But um, I didn't think about um, any kind of like sort of vegetarian ideas, like not eating meat, until I was like thirteen when I read this book called something like The Young Person's Guide to Saving the Planet or something like that and it had all of these um, like articles about you know, like um, environment and things that you could do to, you know, like, to help stop global warming and stuff like that. Um, Very cool. And, Very cool. And it, and it had in, in this book there was, there was something about like how you should be vegetarian and I don't remember exactly what it said but it, you know I'm sure it was something about like factory farming and the environment. This was like maybe 1990 so yeah. Um, it, you know, like, I mean, I guess now it would be even more extreme, all the things that it, that it said, but so I became vegetarian because of that. That's, that's cool. Um, um, Lily, can I ask you a favor? Can you yeah. just, just a little bit adjust your laptop so I can see slightly above your head just a little bit? Ah, yes, that, that makes that's sense. That's great. That's great. Um, you know, that's, that's an interesting area that you grew up in, uh, and and I think aren't there like some Earth First people up there? Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. That's exactly where the Earth First Center is. Um, like Judy Berry was uh was like a sort of a neighbor. We lived on the same road. It's like um, um, outside of the town is called Willits, and like there are a few kind of mountains outside of it where the sort of people lived, like the hippie populations were, and that's one of them. So yeah, yeah. it's exactly there. Very um, interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So, I yeah. Through there, and it's it's beautiful, and it's very different than other parts of California. Very unique area. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's funny because when I was a kid, that all seemed completely normal to me. But you know, like now, when people ask me, like I say, I'm going to visit my mom because she still lives there in California, and they think you know, like beaches, and <laughs> and then they yeah. think Southern California, and I'm like, no, no, it's not like that at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, it is a really unusual place. Um, that's cool. That's cool. So. 
All right, and, so so you read this book when you were 13, and uh, did you at that time decide, well, I'm going to do this vegetarian thing? Yeah, so I became vegetarian, and that was obviously like fine with you know my parents. They they didn't they didn't care. Um, they sound really cool. Was, yeah, <laughs> they they are definitely like really cool. Yeah, um, and um, I was vegetarian for a few months, and then. Uh, I mean, now this seems really stupid, but at the time, like, I thought that I was being quite enlightened because I, you know, like, I kind of thought about how, like, sort of everything is is one and, like, everything on the planet is alive and kind of like the really annoying plants are feelings argument. I thought, like, well, really, like, does it make sense to be vegetarian, you know, like, if you're then sort of saying that, you know, like, trees aren't alive? And I hadn't seen any pictures then of slaughterhouses or, you know, like, factory farming. I didn't, like, actually sort of know what it really meant, so I, I decided that I would officially kind of stop being vegetarian. But from then on, I, like, I hardly ever ate meat. I don't remember, like, kind of more than, you know, like, maybe, I don't know, two or three occasions sort of until I was, like, 23, you when know, I became officially vegetarian again, that I ate meat. You know what you reminded me of is um, kind of like the Native American approach to food, and it's like, it's all, it's all spiritual, and there's kind of a... Uh, almost like a ceremonial quality to eating food and and I think in many ways at least that's a little more conscious than just just eating eating a the sad diet without any awareness but yeah I, I it's interesting yeah and at the time when I was a teenager I got really interested in um, like Native American cultures and I was like you know wanted to learn um, Navajo and um, I Sort of collected all these Native Amer American language books, um, and so I was like kind of interested in that sort of philosophy. But um, I think I like I didn't really connect it to the actual practical in like what is happening to animals and why animals are really very different from plants in terms of like sentience. Um, yeah, yeah. But so um, sorry, go on. No, yeah, that's I totally understand that, and I. Yeah, I, I can see that, and and you know, and in in the defense of Native Americans, it's like they they did what they could. I mean, they they were they were corralled out into the deserts, and you you eat what you can eat, you know, and mm. that is, but yeah, but anyway, go ahead. So um, let's see. The only other thing I I think I forgot to talk about, um, like from childhood, is like kind of fitness and that kind of thing. So like my entire family is completely unathletic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my my dad said that when he was in I don't know like high school or college that he like was required to take some sport unit and so he picked golf because that seemed like the least amount of like <laughs> movement <laughs> required. Um, <laughs> so um, when, like when I was a kid, um, I did um, gymnastics and I played soccer, and I was really bad at both of them. But like even the fact that I wanted to do that was just totally bewildering and shocking to my parents, and they were like, "We have no <laughs> idea where this came from." <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, and um, then like my my mum when I was um, about eleven, she um, got an autoimmune disease. Um, it's very similar to lupus. It's called rheumatomyositis. Um, and so she got really sick. And she was like trying to avoid um, like Western medicine. But like sadly, I, I just think now I think looking back, it's such a shame that she didn't find out about like you know, veganism because I think that things could have been very different. Um, so she was doing homeopathy and like that didn't work and then finally she ended up having to you know like go down the like steroids route and um, and and it sort of just like got worse and worse so um, that's a shame. so that's yeah um, what, what are what are the, can you say the name of that again and can you describe the symptoms yeah it's called um, dermatomyositis um, so it just means an inflammation of the skin and muscles um, and it's very similar to lupus so it it's um it's an autoimmune disease where um, like the body attacks the skin and the muscles um, wow. so it's just like kind of like muscles get weaker and weaker and you get like um, skin lesions and um, it's really horrible <laughs> um, and like kind of by the time they worked out what it was because they first thought that it was lupus and they started giving her um, like medication for lupus and that didn't work and then they were like hmm we don't know what to do now um, and by the time she got to see a specialist and the specialist recognized what it was like she had to go into hospital for three weeks and like have very high doses of um, of steroids because it's like her um, um, like throat muscles had stopped working and her lungs were like kind of stopping working wow. so she was like, really about to die. Um, how, how is she so, now? Yeah. What's her um, health like now? Now she's like um, 
essentially like she can't really go like go out of the house and she's in a wheelchair and um, oh. because she's she's been taking like prednisone for like 25 years um, yeah. and like lots of other things as well because prednisone causes bone damage and so it's like really um, yeah not not good and I so I don't know if it's too late now but I like I was thinking McDougal um, is based in Santa Rosa, which is like an hour and a half away from where she is. So when we go visit, I'm thinking we should like try to convince her somehow if she could go to see him. Um, yeah, that's a great idea, Lily. And so, I'm thinking too. I don't know how. What's her weight like? Is her weight? Uh, is she? Is she uh, thin? No, um, because I mean she always was, but because she's been like kind of um, you know it's basically unable to move for so long and has you know sort of just like been in bed. So no, I think that. Um, like I think that, um, like veganism would really be really good for him. Um, absolutely, all kinds of things. absolutely, and possibly so. even possibly even therapeutic fasting if it wasn't if it's not too extreme. But, mm. yeah. but anyway, um, so. so so yeah, so okay, let's let's go on. So uh, after you were kind of doing the, um, I'll eat everything because it's all it's all energy kind of approach what what happened where you started to um, consider vegetarianism again or, or veganism well um, see when I started university um, in London um, I was 23 and I was like kind of I would say like sort of almost vegetarian but not not completely but like I never bought meat or like you know cooked meat at home or anything like that and so it kind of like occasionally I would like you know, get like, I don't know, a chicken sandwich or something. Yeah. And um, when I was um, in my first year at university, um, there was someone else on uh, on my course who was a vegan. And um, I hadn't ever met a vegan as far as I know before. And I, he didn't really talk about it. He just said he was a vegan for ethical reasons. Um, and I liked the idea of it. Like somehow I just liked the idea. Of it kind of instinctively appealed to me, even though he didn't. He didn't really talk about it. So like I didn't know about you know like what was on in dairy farms or like the egg production or anything. Um, yeah. And I thought um, I like I remember um, like speaking of the, like sandwiches. I I kind of quite near to the beginning of the year. I'd like bought this um, you know chicken sandwich in the cafeteria, and I remember like holding it thinking this doesn't like feel right I'm not I don't want to eat this and um, and so like that was the last time I ate meat so from then on I was like okay I'm going to be vegetarian and because like this this guy was vegan I just somehow liked the idea of that because it seems somehow I don't know I like the idea of no animal products even though I hadn't looked into it at all um, and so I thought oh, I'll try being vegan but um, I wasn't actually like a complete vegan because and this sounds really silly because this isn't something I hear a lot as a sort of impediment to becoming vegan but I thought I couldn't give up honey um, <laughs> so um, I, so I wasn't ever completely vegan but I gave up um, like kind of um, um, eggs and, and dairy for a while and I already had in the back of my head because of my mum that like dairy wasn't good so I didn't have a problem with that um, so you I know, was uh, kind of so mm -hmm. I, I'm glad you're saying this Lily because um, I know really would would say that about honey but uh, uh, you know to me it, it's not on the same level as killing cows I so uh, I respect vegans who think you know you can't eat honey but yeah I, I I think for for meat eaters or conventional eaters that still want to eat honey you know I think it's probably something to <laughs> give them some leeway on. It's <laughs> it's kind of like I guess the, the sort of the last thing to go. I mean, like now it's it's really easy because it, like there's so many other things, you know, like kind of that are, that are similar to honey that don't yeah. come from animals. But um, so I was kind of like almost vegan for um a few months, but still I didn't look into it. Like I didn't read anything, which like now seems to me like crazy that why you know like I didn't. I like kind of want to know any more about you know what exactly is wrong with it, but I just kind of like accepted that like this is quite a nice lifestyle. And then um, I um, became quite involved with um, the like sort of Orthodox Jewish community um, in London because I, so my family, as you could probably already guess from what I said before, was like completely secular. My parents were both Jewish, but like we were not involved in any kind of uh, sort of organized Jewish stuff or anything. Okay. Um, yep. And because I, I was studying, um, I, I wanted to be a Hebrew teacher, um, so I was studying Hebrew and Jewish studies. Interesting. Um, interesting. And now, um, Lily, mm -hmm. let me 
Let me ask you, um, when you were in California, did your parents like, homeschool you or did you attend public school? or? Um, I was homeschooled at first, for the first couple of years, and then I wanted to go to school because um, I wanted to be normal. <laughs> um, um, even that, like, even though we weren't the only family like this, they were like the, we were pretty much the norm. But I still, you know, like knew that there were other kids who went to school, and like that seemed like it would be normal. And my mom was really against it, you know, because she she didn't want me to go to school. So for the first year, I went to this um, this like hippie school that that. Um, used to exist there that was kind of like out in the woods and some people sent their kids to this school and so at the end of that year I was like no that's not normal enough <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so she kind of reluctantly let me go to um, like public school like in the town and um, so oh, yeah. I I did that for a few years and then I realized that actually I didn't like like I didn't like being in school and that it didn't make me any more normal <laughs> um, and, um, and so I, you know, when I said I was about so this is like the Sixth, end of the sixth grade, the seventh grade. I was like, okay, I don't want to be in school anymore. And so she said, that's fine. And so I went back to homeschooling, which um, was like pretty common in the area. So they have a kind of thing set up for it. Um, that's and, really um, cool. That's really cool. So that was yeah. That was the end of the kind of official school. Um, and and, um, then I, and I guess I guess you said this, but were were both of your parents from London originally? No, um, I have like no family, like nothing to do with um, the UK. Uh, what happened was when I was a teenager, I lived in Israel, where I, I do have family. Okay. Um, and I um, I met this English guy when I was there, and he was in university, and so I came here to visit him, and that was how I ended up staying here. And then yeah. I decided um, that I wanted to go to university, um, and so I um, I was very lucky because I had these like you know bizarre, um, inadequate qualifications, but at the time here they had, it's stricter now, but then they had this very um, sort of liberal philosophy to students who are over 21 were considered like mature students and they would take kind of other experiences in place of like all of the standard qualifications and so that was how I got to go to university here. Um, you know, that's, that's really cool Lily and, and I would say judging by your background it, it is very interesting and very uh, I, I, it sounds like more than many children, you had a very broad education as you grew up. It's very interesting. <laughs> so I think I was lucky because in a lot of places they would have just said no. So, um, but um, I'd done a like TEFL course um, because I, my initial plan was um, to teach English, and then um, it was actually I was in Indonesia. Um, this is before I started university, so this is going back a, a couple of years before what I was talking about just now. Um, yeah. But um, so I was lucky to get that job without a degree, but for most um, English teaching jobs you needed a degree just in anything. Um, and so that was when I decided, okay, if, like if I want to go on um, teaching English, I'll, I'll do a degree. And, and because I was like, you know, I was interested in Hebrew and, I'd, um, um, yeah. and I spoke Hebrew, I thought if it's in something that might be useful, I'll do that. But I didn't really have any exact plans. So yeah, so when I started the degree, that um, the um, London um, Jewish community is is like quite close knit, and I mean it's it's re relatively big, but um, it's and varied as well. Like there are all kinds of different denominations, but um, hmm. a lot of the like people doing Hebrew and Jewish studies um, at, at UCL University College London, you know, kind of are sort of within the Jewish community, and so I sort of wanted to become more involved in that, and so. I ended up like I kind of went through the different denominations and like sort of ended up um, becoming like quite um, orthodox. Ah. And so if you're like keeping if you're keeping kosher and you have to buy things that have a kosher label, then um, it just like is it, it, the way I saw it at the time. I think because I hadn't done any research, it was too hard. I mean, it was really hard to find things that were both labeled vegan and labeled kosher. Oh yeah. So, um, and like because you know, like the laws of kashrut, they separate meat and milk, so you have like a lot of things that are meaty and they won't have any dairy in them, but then if you have like kind of vegetarian things, they will usually like have cheese or eggs. So I thought it's too hard to be vegan, I'll just go back to being vegetarian, which is like fr so frustrating because if only I had, you know, like looked it up and but like seen, you know, like what goes on, then I never would have done that. But at the time I thought it was okay, I never considered going back to eating meat, um, and I used to have arguments. I, I stayed with this um, with this family, rabbi's family, 
and I used to have arguments with them about you know, like meat and why it's like great to eat meat and it's you know like ultimate purpose of animals is to like you know be slaughtered by a, a kosher slaughter and so I was That's like always mm, sorry Lily, Lily since you're on this, this is really interesting um, I'm sure you know being vegan the the, uh, the quote from Genesis and then mm. if you go on uh, later within the Jewish tradition there's there are all these rules about what's kosher um, and I'm always saying you know why don't we go back to Genesis where they're talking yeah. about before the fall what's what's your interpretation of that transition from before the fall and then into you know what's kosher yeah it's really interesting so the way it seems to me um, is that yeah in the in the creation story in the garden of Eden Eden it, it clearly says like you know seed bearing plants plants are given to you for food um, and I think that that's the way it was sort of supposed to be according to that story then um, like humanity becomes so debauched that you know they they just like God is sick of them and wants to destroy them and then they have the flood and then after the flood um, God says okay as a kind of like um, sort of compromise because they have such bloodthirsty natures I'll let them eat meat because like maybe that will stop them killing each other so to me like that really obviously says ideally like no one would eat meat because this is just a kind of concession to bloodthirsty natures and like why do we want to be encouraging that like we should say um, there, there's, there's another like Jewish concept tikkun olam which is like um, sort of perfection of the world like how it's our job as humans to make the world a better place and uh -huh. so I say this is a perfect example of tikkun olam like we can say that this concession was given like you know to a bunch of lunatics who are killing each other but why should that now be our model we should go back to something like much better <laughs> um, so that that's how I see it and I used to argue about that as well like with um, you know like with this rabbi family um, Absolutely. but there's, can, but there's can, also, I, mm -hmm. can I ask you something else um, uh, it just popped into my head um, I'm sure you know a lot of fundamental Christians they have this uh, they try to propose a literal interpretation of these of these old religious texts and I'm I'm wondering within the Jewish tradition uh, would you say that the book of Genesis is allegorical uh, would you say that it maybe it, it reflects um, indirectly perhaps uh, a, uh, something that was happened as man evolved from a more uh, primate orientation into human orientation how how does that how does yeah. that go with an orthodox um, so in the in like the the orthodox view everything in the bible is always interpreted through a rabbinic lens so um, you have the I mean first of all you have the Hebrew Bible um, and it's always understood that you can't just look at that on its own you have to look at it with commentaries so there are all of these layers of commentaries that have been written in you know, like kind of from um, from the rabbinic period into the medieval period and, and like early modern like so um, so like the basic commentary that um, the that the Bible's always read with is Rashi um, and Rashi was like 11th century um, from France and he like kind of did this commentary on, um, on you know like on it's mostly the the Torah that like the people um, read but the first five books but um, right. but so it will always be like Chumash which is like the, the Torah with Rashi and so sometimes the explanations that you get in Rashi or other commentators as well are quite far removed from like the literal explanation that you would get if you just read the Bible um, and so a lot of the, the like the laws the laws are all like sort of interpreted through a rabbinic lens so um, like say in the Hebrew Bible it says um, that like someone um, who doesn't keep the Sabbath should be stoned and then if you go to the rabbinic literature they will like, kind of explain that so that it's impossible like it will never happen um, so there are a lot of like really gory laws and like an eye for an eye in um, in like the rabbinic interpretation, which is what everyone follows, that's monetary compensation. So like the uh, and I mean I like, historically, I I don't know. I think that um, these these stories and this is a kind of like progressive Jewish viewpoint, I guess. Um, okay. Okay. That um, is that you had these different stories that evolved orally, and at some point they were redacted. And so, you, like, you get a kind of cohesive narrative, but they don't all come from the same tradition or from the same time. And so, even like within the book of Genesis, like, they're two different creation stories. And um, so, you can right. interpret it in different ways. Like, the traditional interpretation is to say, 
one of them wants to show you one aspect of creation, another one wants to show you a different aspect, but you could also interpret them as being two different stories by two, some two different streams of tradition that were sort of then put together uh, either, you know, kind of ineptly by, by an editor who didn't realize that he was putting two stories together <laughs> or like kind of intentionally as a sort of yeah. literary device. So you get all of these different ways of interpreting um, these things, but um, usually like even in orthodox circles that it's never just like what it what is written in the Bible, it's always with interpretation. I mean, okay, and let me ask you, like, let me ask you personally, do you, so when you, I, I know you've studied this, so for, so I'm sure it influences you, but when you read these, these texts, do you, do you automatically kind of default to a rabbinic lens, or do you feel that you can interpret kind of intuitively what you're reading? How, what's your take on it? Um, I guess kind of a mix of both. So uh, I teach Biblical Hebrew now um, huh. So at, at UCL, so I, I just stayed there and never left. <laughs> so, All right. Um, so like the, the stories that, um, you know, like I teach in, it's part of a language class, so, you know, like kind of I mostly focus on grammar, that's sort of my, my thing, <laughs> rather than interpretation on, on any kind of, you know, like, sort of advanced level, but um, I sort of read the stories, like now I enjoy the stories and sort of take things that I, you know, remember having read in different commentaries that I like, and um, I think that's a, that's quite an accepted way of doing it in sort of in the Jewish tradition is just to sort of, you, they, like, they're these, they're these characters, because um, that's what I like best in, in the Hebrew Bible, I like the narrative stories, and so you have these crazy family dramas, and um, and the characters are kind of um, like the patriarchs, they're sort of like um, eternal, it, like in Jewish tradition I think it's, it's kind of a feeling that, you know, sort of that they're still around today and they kind of change with the times and um, that they are like these sort of living characters that we know rather than just... Um, Almost uh, ar archetypal, archetypal. Yeah. I mean, you do have like um, Jacob is like clearly like from the trickster archetype. He's like a coyote sort of character, and um, so I think that they're just they're just really good stories that um, have like many different ways of interpretation. Um, and there's a saying, "Shivim um, panim la There are seventy faces to the Torah, and they're all correct, meaning that like you know there there are many different ways that you can interpret all of these things. So I think I like that, that is something that I love that. I love that. Okay, so 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 what happened is you're you're kind of following a an orthodox Jewish approach to diet, and you're trying to meld that with your vegan approach. So you went you went vegetarian to kind of try and make it work, and then what happened next? Yeah, so I did that for a few years, and then I I kind of um, I, I left um, that community, and um, I moved somewhere else in London, um, and like kind of wasn't like really associated with with that like rabbi's family anymore and I kind of became like sort of gradually a bit less observant um, mm -hmm. and um, then I just kind of became an inertia vegetarian I guess because I hadn't ever looked into anything I didn't like realize now I can go back to being vegan or I'm start being vegan properly um, so I just didn't think about it and I was like quite happy being vegetarian I thought I'm like you know vegetarian because of animal rights and I just sort of thought like that's all there is to it and that's good enough yeah um, that's what I did and, for a long time yeah and it, yeah. now it's like why <laughs> but um so it's really frustrating <laughs> um, and um, so then um, I met um, my partner James um, and you'll hear more about um, his side of the story from him but um, we, so we were both vegetarian for like five years and then uh, like uh, you know after we met um, and then um, last year like kind of in the end of last year he, he said to me um, he'd been thinking a lot about um, just like animal suffering and he um, he's an artist and he has a, um, a stall in Camden Market in London and there are a lot of um, like pigeons that come to the market um, you know like looking for food and and he said he'd like he'd seen a lot of pigeons that had like a broken leg or something and they you know just because he, he was outside all day he was just watching the pigeons and I was like getting really upset like thinking about the awful life that these pigeons have oh. and I think he, he started doing some research um, but I didn't know I think he started watching some videos on YouTube of like pizza videos or something and he, and I didn't really know this though but um, he said to me like one day I'm thinking of like maybe becoming vegan and I said 
oh, that would be great. I like the idea of that. Um, like still not having, having done any research. Um, but like again, it just appealed to me. Um, somehow not enough to have taken the initiative to you know do it myself or investigate. Um, so um, then we thought like, oh, I don't know, maybe this is a crazy idea because he's allergic to nuts and legumes. So uh -huh. we thought at the time we were like, you know, like would it even be possible to become vegan like with with a nut allergy? And like obviously now that's just ridiculous. But at the time we were like, oh, I don't know. So um, yeah, I can totally can totally understand that. Yeah, yeah. And it, especially because because he's had this allergy, he's like kind of um, always been very cautious about like food that he doesn't know. And so he. Um, He'd kind of like you know grown up thinking the safe things were like bread and cheese and Mars bars, <laughs> basically. So, um, so you know the thought of like well, not being able to have cheese and like what will we replace it with and like would this be possible? Um, and so like still not having done any research, I said okay, um, like I'll just stop buying anything with animal products in it and then we'll see how we manage. And um, he was saying like maybe we can gradually phase things out over the period of a few months and. Um, then we um, we went to um, stay with his mum who lives in Wales, like just for a week. Um, this was like at the end of December last year, and um, so I never would have thought of looking on YouTube. Um, but like James likes YouTube, and like he has a channel, and he's kind of always goes to YouTube to look for things. And yeah. so he, he found he found all of these videos. So he found I think the first one was um, 101 reasons to go vegan. Um, but you often see it like come up on the side of things. It's it's kind of like Gary Yurovsky's speech, and we watched that. And we've been thinking, you know, like we'll talk about like maybe phasing things out, seeing if it's possible. And we watched that, and then we were both just like, "That's it! Like, there's no way we can ever go back!" Like, and we were both just like so horrified that these things are not public knowledge. We were like, "Why doesn't everyone know about this?" Like, you know, about the dairy industry and the eggs. I was like, this "Eggs, like, like." Just like they grind up the chicks alive, like how is that even possible? Like, and um, yeah. and I was like, it's amazing, it's 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 horrifying, it's horrifying, yeah. Yeah, and so we watched a few videos like that, and then we were like, you know, there's just no way that we will ever eat any animal products again. Like that's it. It's not like you know, and, and then we weren't even like worried about you know like whether we will have enough to eat or not and then like obviously as, <laughs> as we did more research after that we've like discovered that like it's ridiculous to think you won't have enough to eat because there's so many different things that you know, like you don't need nuts and you like you don't need pulses and then we found out about um in like the um like 80 10 10 like kind of you know you really you can just eat fruits and vegetables yeah uh, and like all of those you know the various different things and it's like it's not an issue at all and so like now it just seems laughable you know, Lily, you're reminding me of something. Uh, Carlo, a, a gentleman I interviewed recently, he, he was saying, you know, even if he found out that it was healthier to include some animal products, he wouldn't because of ethical reasons. So I think yeah. it's kind of like what you're saying. It's like it doesn't matter if if I get sick, I'm not going to participate. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That that was exactly how we felt. Um, and so fortunately, it turned out to be just the opposite. But you know, like we but we didn't care at the time. We're like. No, yeah. there's just yeah. no way that you can even look at those things as food. I think, like once you know, um, and um, definitely. So I think, like, yeah, from from then on, um, we we've just been like kind of um, felt like we somehow wanted to do as much as we could to kind of like make up for all of the time when we didn't know and like weren't vegan. And so then you get into doing like, how can you kind of spread the message, but you know, like without annoying people? And because um, like I yeah. remember yeah. once like sort of towards the beginning of this, um, after like I, I came back to my department because that this happened during the winter break and um and I was like talking to um our administrator, the departmental administrator who like isn't even vegetarian and like I was talking about the eggs because I just watched this video um about the eggs and I was so horrified. I was like and then they like they take all of the chicks and they suffocate them or they like throw them in grinders and she was like <laughs> and uh, and then I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Have I said too much? And um <laughs> and uh, and you know she was like, oh no, I'm really shocked. I had no idea. I like I don't think um I like I, I don't think she's like actually changed anything. But I felt like well at least like she you know she's heard of this now and so maybe yeah. it's like the point yeah um but um because I just felt like this should be on the news, like, you know, this should be the most important thing that everyone is told before they're told anything else, like, nothing else is as important as this. Um, Amen. And, so, Amen. And, 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 like, it's funny because I think, like, I think when, 
when I was vegetarian, I I didn't really see it. Like I I knew that like slaughterhouses like were awful and that you know like killing animals was bad, but I somehow didn't. It didn't seem as urgent as like after becoming vegan, because at yeah. the time I was like, well, sorry, go on. Yeah. That's so true, Lily. That was the same for me. It's like, really? I, you know, I I made this decision to be vegetarian, and I and I just I didn't think I could do the vegan thing nutritionally, healthfully, you know. Mm -hmm. And I had this like belief about it, so I was like, well, vegetarian's the best I'm going to do, and and I didn't see the connection to the dairy industry and yeah, and and yeah, and just the the slaughter, man. It's it's yeah, it's, and 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 I don't even now like looking at it because it's so awful. You know? It's just, yeah, it's just so like horrifically upsetting that um, now I kind of feel like, I think maybe because of like watching the videos and like once you've seen them then you, you can't forget. And I think like beforehand it was kind of, it was a bit more abstract. It's like I, you know, I knew that like killing animals is, is wrong, like that was how it seemed to me, but like I hadn't looked into like how horrifying it was. and. Um, you know, like not just the killing, but like the whole factory farming process, and yeah, yeah. so it kind of I was like, well, I'm vegetarian, and it's kind of like you know, other people, it's their choice, and I don't, you know, really think that they should be eating animals. But I kind of, I didn't think about it so much. It was a bit more passive, and now I kind of feel like, like this is just a terrible, terrible wrong that has to stop immediately. And <laughs> like, what can we do? <laughs> so um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're so right. You're so right. <laughs> So, um, so I'm kind of, okay, so yeah. so um, you know, I, I I want you to keep going as you are. Um, somewhere along the line, I want to I, I forgot uh, because you've gone through a bunch of transitions, and I want you to tie in uh, each transition you went through with um, a, a, a physical health uh, uh, responses. But but go ahead and continue as you are. So so. Does that kind of bring you up to present day, or? or yeah, that's, that's yeah, that's pretty much it. So, um, just um, I guess now, like sort of in terms of um, like promoting the message, what the only things that I'm doing at the moment are I leave leaflets around the university, like um, like vegan society leaflets, um, and you know, kind of try to um, mention things to people. I have you know, like the, like vegan badges and things, and like kind of hope that people will ask me about them. And then when I do, then I like kind of you know have to like tell them in a in a kind of like friendly way. <laughs> um, so that's sort of all that I've managed to do up until now. But I would like to do more, which was um, why I was so excited to be in an interview because like I love watching these interviews um, and you know hopefully they'll well, reach yeah, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad you did. You you you've got a wealth of information and and yeah, you should definitely definitely do do videos, man. You'd be awesome. So um, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, yeah. So okay. So tell me a little bit about if you can um, as you went through these stages. But you grew up eating uh, animal products. Then thirteen, you went vegetarian mm -hmm. for a while. Then you went back, and then you went vegetarian again, and eventually vegan. So <laughs> as as you went through these various stages. Would you say your health was relatively constant, or did your health uh, express uh, uh, any uh, negative effects of these animal product periods? Well, um, I I think it, like up until we became vegan, like just recently, there wasn't ever anything really that noticeable. Um, probably because because I didn't, I wasn't ever like kind of eating a like really animal product heavy diet and then switched dramatically so I, I didn't ever notice any um, any differences in, until recently um, but so what it was because I had you know this kind of looming specter of autoimmune disease in my family I was always like really worried about that um, yeah. and um, I always um, like kind of felt like tired and like I didn't have enough energy and um, which was like something that, that my mum had so um, I was always kind of worried about that, and it was like, you know, like that maybe I will get lupus or something. So this was kind of always a bit ominous. Um, but um, I mean, the main thing was that I always felt like kind of tired and run down, and like, um, and and like when I was when I was vegetarian. So this is like kind of from most of my adult life. Like you know, some people say like, oh, it's because you're vegetarian, like you don't get enough iron. And I just like knew that that was ridiculous. Like somehow I didn't. That never worried me. Um, but 
I just thought that this is something genetic because my my mum even before she was diagnosed with like the disease, she always like always said she was always tired and never had any energy, and she was always just like you know in bed a lot and. Um, so I was always like that as well, and I like kind of tried to get everything done that I had to get done. Um, but I was always just like, uh, and now I'm just going to lie down. Um, and I was kind of like this um, in, until like we became vegan, and then like kind of we were sort of just vegan for a couple of months and like experimenting with you know like different things, but um, didn't find out about the high carb um, lifestyle until I think maybe like March. Um, and again, it was because James was always looking at YouTube, and he found out about um, in like Freely and Jane Ryder and all of all of the um, high carb movement. And so then we we started trying that, and like almost instantly, it was like, oh my god, I have so much energy. <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> um, and like I'm not tired anymore. I, and I used to like take um, like I always got headaches, and I would take um, like sulfadine, which is like. Um, like paracetamol and codeine, like so it's quite strong, but it's available over the counter here. And I would take that like almost every day, like for years. Huh. Um, and um, and like you know, I was like always tired. And if I did something like um, I teach these like intensive um, Yiddish summer courses, like one week language summer courses, and like they're really you know kind of like sort of morning till evening. And like every year, I've like been teaching them for like ten years. I would always like take um, like caffeine tablets during the day, and um, and like you know, also I was like always like drinking green tea, and so um, this year um, I just like had it in August, and I like have like kind of completely stopped drinking caffeine, um, like and, and never like take sulfidine anymore, and like I hardly ever get headaches, and so I was like, wow, <laughs> that's really impressive. Um, so that's yeah, amazing. yeah. So I think that was like absolutely the thing that did it because like I I think I guess. Um, I don't know, you, you just kind of assume, you know, with these sort of standard society, like the, you know, small meat eater portion sizes, <laughs> you like, you know, kind of think like that you shouldn't really eat any more than that. And then like when you could become vegan and, and then you see that like, you know, these people that have like giant plates, it's kind of like makes sense because it's, you know, like plants. So, um, yeah, yeah. That's, so a, that's that, a great, it's a great point. It's a great point. And I, I was just talking the, yesterday with someone about the, the fact that, um, a lot of uh, conventional eaters, when they go, when they shift to vegan, they kind of want to duplicate um, th their past diet. And and the person I was talking to was saying, you know, just let go of this this inclination to duplicate, you know, meat based meals. It's like open yourself up to to kind of a new way of eating and just enjoy foods on their own right. It's mm. um, you know. I, I know that you know we have things like tofurkey and uh, you know these artificial yeah. meats and artificial cheeses and and if they can help people to transition that's great use them but I, I think there's uh, a lot of sense to just kind of wiping out your memory of of this past way of living and just open yourself up to a totally new approach. Yeah, and uh, no, it's it's really great. Um, I mean, I think that that's um, the thing that like society finds the strangest is like, you know, if you bring like 10 bananas in with you in the morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> because like, just being vegan, I haven't really had, you know, that, that many like negative comments or anything. But um, yeah, that they're like, like, what is in that smoothie? And by this time, I think if you're like sort of into the YouTube, like high carb community, like this all seems normal to you because it's like seems like everybody does it, and yeah. so I was like, um, I have some blueberries, ten bananas, and they were like, "What?" <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and so we're like, I don't know, like you know, like for lunch you have like three plain potatoes, like that's crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think uh, like when you're so happy, you don't care. It's like, well, if people want to think that's strange, it's fine because you know, like I'm having this like great. Um, you know, kind of great lifestyle, so it's all right. I love it, Lily. I love it. And and so for you, the primary thing in terms of health you've noticed is increased energy. Any other benefits, like um, perhaps more regularity in in elimination, that sort of thing? Um, I haven't really like paid much attention to um to okay. any, but I think just generally, um. I, yeah, just like no aches and pains, like because I yeah I used to have like aches and pains, like muscle pains all the time, and 
Um, and like I said, headaches and like just kind of feeling like fatigue or like, you know, I kind of want to go to sleep for most of the day if I could. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, I've never ever been a morning person. I don't think I ever will be, but it's a lot easier to get up early now because I also like started drinking a lot of water because, you know, like that kind of goes along with it. And so I think like drinking a lot of water is is also like a really big part of it. Like, that seems to make a difference. So like, I mean, for me, because because I sort of initially became vegan because of the animals, this is all just like a great side benefit. But it was so nice to find it out as well because like, Obviously, there are lots of ways that you can be vegan, and you don't have to be high carb, and you don't have to drink lots of water. But like, because those things are also, you know, connected, you hear people talking about them sort of in the same community. It's like, why not? And then you're like, well, this is great. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is a really interesting point you're you're making here, and I think um, it's it's kind of good in a way. Uh, a lot of people have kind of gone to this very very strict kind of raw thing, and and learned a lot, and then maybe come back a little bit and and maybe included some cooked foods, but they've learned some great principles. Um, now, now, unfortunately, some people who have gone really extreme got fed up and then went back to eating meat, and I hope that doesn't happen too frequently, but I think, mm -hmm. I think you're making a great point. It's like there's a lot to learn there, and then you can kind of work out your own vegan approach that's, that's very healthy, but perhaps not super rigid about, you know, 100% raw or you know, any any too 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 rigid in any area. You know? Yeah, that's what I think. Because we um we kind of we sort of experimented with a few different things. Um, like hundred percent raw is just something that like it's just not for me. I can't do it. I <laughs> um um and I know like some people would say that is because you're addicted to cooked food. But I think the whole cooked food addiction thing is um Happy Healthy Vegan has a really good video about that. And I just think like. I, I agree. I agree. I, I think that term is is has really very little value. I I, I don't. I, yeah, I agree with you. And I think you know, like w within a sort of whole foods, plant based approach. Um, I mean, even if it's not whole foods, and and somebody is happy being like a junk food vegan, like to me, that's that's great because you know, like for the you know for the animals in the environment, it doesn't really matter, and that's you know their choice. That's what I think. Like there's. That's a, that's, a great, that's a great point, Lily. That's a great point. Usually, you know, I'm, I'm poo-pooing, uh, you know, vegans that live on Cheetos, but that's a great point. I mean, they're only hurting themselves. Well, yeah. I guess there's some env environmental issues with that, but, but yeah, I love what you're saying. I mean, it's true that, like, the more um, processed something is, the, the worse it will be for the environment, so that's not good, but on a, like, kind of absolute scale, I think, yeah. you know, it's, I, I, I would prefer to get the message out that, like, there are infinite numbers of ways to be vegan and you know like to me that's kind of like a moral baseline and then after that you, you just find the thing that works for you and like not everybody is that interested in like you know health or like being you know like really health conscious and so I, like you know I think that that's fine but um because I like it's, that, it's I like that a lot. That's, <laughs> um, that's a powerful point yeah I like that so um but yeah and I, I think the thing that seems to um, work best for us is kind of like a sort of mix of raw till four starch solution kind of like I like fruit but I I don't usually manage or like I somehow it, it doesn't work very well like having only fruit throughout the day because I sort of was trying to do that like for the past few months and then finally I just thought like why be like so restrictive because I think when you get into the this sort of you know community and watching all these things and everyone has a label and it's like are you completely raw or raw till four or this and, and and like I think, you know, like why do we have to have so many labels? I just like I'm happy being, you know, kind of like Whole Foods, high carb. Like high carb, I think is amazing. So within that, I'm not really too worried about exactly, you know, like what formula to follow, and it varies day by day. So I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Well, yeah, this li the label thing it gets out of hand, and it can be a distraction. So it's like that's that's kind of been my uh, interest is get get people vegan. And then we can have these 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 ancillary discussions, but the main yeah. thing go yeah. It's just yeah. To, yeah. I mean, because on its own, it's really not hard to go vegan at all. And like, I think um, it's actually a good thing. I think that um, James has um, this like nut and pulses allergy because often, like, when we talk to people, they're like, "Well, how could you be vegan?" Because like he has this allergy, and then we can say, "Well, actually, it really doesn't matter, and it's easy to be vegan." And you know, like, look, people have all of these different um, you know kind of types of diets within the vegan community and so whatever you're allergic to like there's something to cater for it <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I think that's like actually is 
is a good thing. Um, and I just kind of show how inclusive it is and how like you know like anyone can be vegan. Absolutely, absolutely, huge point. Yeah. Um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a couple of uh, nutrients at you, and and I want you to give me your the conclusions you've reached personally on each one. So the first is vitamin B12. Um, we take a sublingual supplement. Um, I haven't noticed any difference from it, but I just thought, you know, like, well, it's good to take it. But also, um, we use nutritional yeast, like the kind that has B12 in it. So, okay. um, yeah. I haven't been tested, so, I, like, I don't know whether or not, you know, like, there's even any reason to take it or, you know, like, if I'm, like, dangerously yeah. low or anything, but, but I, but I think we're kind of covering ourselves, so I'm not gotcha. worried about that. Gotcha. And I think this this next one might be interesting since you live in England and and this can be an issue particularly I think in the fall and the winter um, sunshine. What what's your take on vitamin D? Yeah, um, I haven't really been worrying about that, and um, it's true that it's a problem because there is not a huge amount of sun here. So for the past few months, it's been really sunny. Until recently, we had like an unusually nice summer. So then I was like, well, lots of vitamin D, it's fine. Um, and um, James was saying that maybe we should take a supplement in the winter because he's a bit worried about it. Um, but I've read in um, like um, McDougall and a few other places that say that you should really avoid supplements if you can and that they may do more harm than good and that they're not like doing what the sun would do. Um, so like the other option is that um, like the tanning beds, are, um, yeah. there's also a machine like a uh, vitamin D machine, which is quite expensive, it's like 300 pounds, it's like $500 or something. So I don't know if it's, like, if it's a long-term problem, like, I would pro I would think that the machine would be better because you, like, once you bought it, you wouldn't have to buy it again and then you wouldn't have to go to the tanning places, which just, like, I can't really see myself doing. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, I mean, I've, <laughs> I haven't done I, that. I totally, I totally hear you. I, I totally hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so for the for the moment, I'm not worrying about it, um, and I, I don't know. I think James is more worried about it than me. So probably, if we find some solution, it will be because he, you know, is kind of like um, instigating it. Um, yeah, but that, yeah. That, that machine. It sounds like uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Don Bennett, but I think he talks about building your own sun lamp. Uh, uh, ah, so, okay. Yeah. If you but, can build your own, that would be even better, and that's the sort of thing that like James likes projects. So. That I think <laughs> that that might be more achievable. <laughs> um, okay, so the next one I usually ask about: Have you have you read anything on iodine? Do you are you concerned with that at all? Yeah, iodine. Um, we like we occasionally um, eat like, nori and like and sushi, and then I've seen all the stuff about like how you know like you should never eat anything from the sea because it's also polluted and like that's worse than not getting enough iodine. And I really don't know because with all of these things, it just seems like there's there's so much like kind of pro and con everything that you end up feeling like you don't know which is worse. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. So at the moment, like. I, again, I'm not really worrying about it. Maybe I should worry about these things more, but I don't. Um, <laughs> and so I just think, like, well, sometimes we eat nori, and um, I don't know uh, I, if there's some way to tell if you have. I don't even know if, how you tell if you have a deficiency, like until. Yeah, it's yeah. I think you, there late. are some special there are special tests you can do. Um, what I've heard some people have noticed is that if they didn't have it for a long time and they introduced it. Uh, Either through food or through very careful supplementation, because you can, if you if you supplement with iodine the wrong way, it can cause problems. But uh, um, but apparently there's some kind of uh, energy uh, boost once it's re-added. Uh, so, mm -hmm. but if you're if you're doing uh, seaweed and and you, I don't know if you guys use iodized salt. I I think that can that can take care of it. Yeah, we use um, sea salt, which supposedly doesn't have anything added to it. So I'm assuming that that doesn't have iodine in it. Um, but, and I don't even know like how much nori you'd have to eat to like kind of cover yourselves because it's not at all regular. But um, yeah. But I kind of think like it's probably okay. <laughs> um, and um, it, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's like you have you you seem to have boundless energy and you feel really healthy. So yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it it must not be that bad. <laughs> 
All right, and and you you reference this earlier water. Do you have a like a specific um, amount that you drink each day, or and do you try to drink more than you're thirsty? How much water do you drink? Um, I've been drinking about three liters, like sometimes four. So like yeah, three to four liters a day, which is like for me just unimaginable because I never could drink water. Like I never liked drinking water, and it was just like something that I never thought would happen. Um, but now I really like it. Um, and I just have a one liter bottle and like I fill it and like you know like drink a liter in the morning and then like kind of another one in, in the afternoon and then like sort of another one sometime in the evening like or at night so it's um it's kind of um, effortless um, that, that's and I, great. yeah because I, I, I could I could stand to drink more water I, that's I'm still working on that so that's that's good to hear that you, you just kind of it became normal for you yeah, one of the things I think that helps is um, is putting a slice of lemon in the bottle because then it kind of makes it like slightly lemony taste and you somehow don't feel like you're just drinking water. It has like a very faint lemon taste. So, yeah, um, yeah. but um, but even other, I think the main thing was the bottle. Like, because if you have a liter bottle and you know that you have to drink it, then you know that you've drank a liter. Like, because otherwise I find it really hard to keep track and then you just have no idea how much you've drunk. So if you just like this liter and another liter and another liter and then you're like ah I've drunk lots of water. Um, yeah, yeah that's, I like that. Yeah, because <laughs> it, it does really seem to make a difference. Yeah, oh, oh it does. Yeah, you can tell. Yeah. I, yeah, I I think so. I mean, it's it's usually you know it's kind of hard to work out what is the result of what, but I think um, it's actually a lot easier now that there are not that many different things because if you if you don't have that many different complicated things going on, then it's easier to isolate. So, um, like, cause I, I used to, um, like drink a lot of green tea, which I think is, is not bad because it's, it's water and also like, you know, green tea is good. Um, but, uh, because it, like it has caffeine, yeah. I just thought like, I, like I can't go to sleep before like two in the morning. And I, even though like people say like caffeine, I was like, yeah, but I don't think it makes any difference. And um, and then finally I thought I'll just like stop drinking green tea altogether. And I, because by that time I thought like, well, the antioxidants aren't such a problem because like now that you know like now that I'm so like kind of so many fruits and vegetables, like I must be getting enough from them, so it's probably not a worry. And I stopped like drinking green tea, and then like I could go to sleep. <laughs> and so I was like, wow, that's amazing. It really was the caffeine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, so, and I'm glad you you said sleep because that was my next question. So, do you um, do you get like eight hours? Do you do you use an alarm clock? Uh, do you go to bed at nine, ten o'clock? What's what's your take on sleep? Yeah. So, and this is another thing that's really changed because I was always like complete night person, and I couldn't go to sleep before like you know two in the morning, and I could often like stay up. I mean, easily I could stay up until four in the morning, and then. I would usually, um, depending on when I had to get up the next day, because I um, like because I'm a lecturer, I don't always have to be somewhere at the same time. So like on days when I'm teaching, then I have to get up at you know like whenever the lecture starts. Um, but and then other days if I'm at home, I'm like working at home, but it's more flexible. So I would always get up at the last possible moment. So like if I had to you know be in at eleven, then I would get up at like. 10 and then you know like kind of have 10 minutes to get ready and then like <laughs> 45 minutes to like to go into university um, and so on days when I had to like be in early I would just get much less sleep and then just be tired the whole day and you know like then kind of wake up again in the evening and then like sleep really late like so it was always very frustrating because I just felt like you know like I, I'm sort of like not in control of like you know like the day and how much sleep I can get and it was awful and I just thought there's nothing I can do about it um, and um, so when um, when we kind of went over to this, this kind of like high carb um, lifestyle and and I stopped drinking tea, um, then I kind of almost instantly I could go to bed at like kind of a which for me is like an extremely civilized time. It's still late by like many other people's standards, but like by like half ten or eleven, yeah, which I never yeah. ever would have been able to do. Um, and like also like getting up early because I used to like. On, on days when I didn't have to be somewhere, I would set my alarm for like 10 or something and like kind of be dreading it and then like it would go off and then I would just like keep pressing snooze and then I would like end up getting up at like 1 and be like, ah, half the day is gone, I have all this stuff to do, it's really frustrating and this was just like a constant, like for years, this was my life, it was just like awful. <laughs> um, so like now, finally, like, like I said, I'm still 
never going to be a morning person, I don't think. But um, so I'm like jealous of people who just like kind of get up at like seven and, and you know they're like I am up now. Um, but I can now like I can get up at like nine and it's not a problem. So for me that's quite an achievement. Um, well, and great, yeah, I, I like that because it implies to me that you you let yourself sleep as much as you want. I like that. Yeah. So I think usually now I like probably get about like I'd say nine or ten hours or like sometimes eleven but like definitely kind of um, like definitely at least nine which is great because I you know like I used to kind of get very different amounts of sleep depending on when I had to be up the next day so yeah, that's great yeah, that, that's a huge improvement alright let me ask you um, if you do you ever what, what's your take on alcohol will, will you ever have like a glass of wine or a beer or do you think that that's just uh, totally unhealthy um, well, I've never really liked alcohol, so um, like I just, I just don't like the taste, and so I've never really drunk that much. Um, and um, it's actually been kind of a relief that sort of been, in, in, it's kind of like an excuse, I guess, that in sort of the high carb community, like that you know, yeah. they drink is not really a thing because I can like kind of now feel like you can say, oh, good, like I never liked drinking, so like now I really don't have to like bother. <laughs> Um, trying to pretend that I do, um, because I, you know, because I would try to like make myself drink wine, like you know, occasionally places like people offer you wine, and so I was like, to, I to be like social, it. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I wouldn't like, yeah, again, like if someone gave me a glass of wine, like I wouldn't say no, but I would probably like just hold it and not really drink it. <laughs> um, and I mean, but I think if I liked it, then I probably would drink it occasionally. Um, yeah. But like, I don't like it, so it's not. It's not a loss. Okay, I don't miss it. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and you touched on this earlier, but since you've read about it, maybe you can add just a few tidbits. Uh, and it's the animal ethics. And what were some of the things that you came across that just really you found, uh, you know, hard to bear? Oh, um, it's oh, it's just all so awful. Um, I think um, one of the things that shocked me the most was the egg production, and that's because that was something that I really had absolutely no idea about, and I, I just I couldn't believe that that went on, and that you know like you know basically sort of every egg like every egg that you see represents a ground up chick. It was just like. I can't believe how horrifying that is, and and that like they have their beaks cut off, and um, yeah. Yeah. like and things. And the other thing that surprised me actually, when when we first became vegan, was um, we listened to I, I think it was um, Gary Francione's lectures. He had some lectures on um, like free range, and you know like why that's meaningless, and that really surprised me because I remember before like going to the supermarket and seeing you know like we would pick free range eggs, and I remember kind of vaguely thinking to myself. How is it possible that there's enough room, you know, like on farms, to provide enough free-range eggs, like to you know feed, like to you know stock all of these supermarkets, and like you know they're trying to get everyone to buy free-range eggs? How is that really possible? Like it seems like they would need a lot of room, like you know. <laughs> but I didn't actually put it together to think they don't really have that much room. It's just a big marketing ploy. And so when I found that out, I was kind of like, I knew it. Like of course it doesn't make any sense. Like why did I fall for that? <laughs> um, because you kind of believe, you know, like what they say, they're like, ah, oh, free range, and they have pictures of, like, you know, the happy, like, chickens, like, strolling around their farm. And I think because people, in their heads, you know, when you think of a farm, you think of, like, something, like, happy and idyllic, and so you, you kind of don't really question it too much. It's like, well, that's what they're saying that they're doing, so they must be doing it. And It's such, you know, a, such a great point, Lily, and the same thing with the dairy, you know, you have, you see these yeah. pictures of cows happily grazing, and it's, yeah. it's that's so soothing, and... and <laughs> It, it it doesn't reveal what's actually going on behind the scenes, yeah. Yeah, I think, and then that was the other thing um, was was dairy because um, like now I just feel so stupid that it didn't occur to me. It's like I didn't even know that the cows had to be pregnant, and then, like I remember when I found that out, I was like, that's so obvious. Like how could I not have known that? And like what do they do with the cows? And so then like when I like all of a sudden realized like so like milk equals veal crate. So like if you're buying any kind of milk product, you're essentially like supporting veal. And I was really shocked about that too because, you know, like kind of anti-veal is, is quite well known even in non-vegetarian vegan circles. And, and yeah. it's just also hypocritical. Like 
why I think that I mean that's one of the things that started to bother me when I found out about this is like what well, you know like why are people making such a big deal about this one particular type of uh, animal cruelty like veal or, you know like or fur um, when like it's all so cruel and like things that nobody would ever even think were were anything other than benign are just as cruel and just because you can't actually like see the evidence like it's easy you know like to see if you're a vegetarian obviously you're like well I don't want to participate in you know like the killing of animals, so I don't eat meat. But eggs, like those are just eggs. They, no animals are killed. Like that's just how you know. Like you wouldn't. I think it's harder to um, it's harder to put it together. And so that was why it's like so frustrating to feel like you've unwittingly for all of these years been participating in something just as bad. And uh, you know, like that's so true. That's so true. Now I I do know there's kind of this um, new movement where people are raising chickens at, at their homes and uh, they're producing eggs at their homes and and I guess there could conceivably be some people who have a chicken or two at their house and the chicken has lots of room and then they never kill the chicken the chicken just grows up that perhaps that's a little better uh, but it's still then you have the health the health effects of eating eggs so. yeah I mean with that there, like there are two things one is sort of now that I've sort of heard so much about the like health benefits of veganism that's just kind of reinforces it um, you know because um, someone asked me um, like a few months ago um, well what would you what about a completely ethical dairy farm would you drink milk from that and I said first of all I said like, I, I don't think there's such a thing as a completely ethical dairy farm and then she lives in Norway and so she was like well actually I know somebody who has this completely ethical dairy farm and like you know she looks the cows herself and the cows are allowed to stay with them and like blah 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 and I was like well and what happens to the cows after that and she was like oh I don't know I didn't think to ask that but I'm sure that nothing bad happens to them because like she loves the cows so much the person who runs this dairy farm and so I was like, well, first of all, that's not sustainable. So, like, if you happen to have one right next to you, that's very, very rare. <laughs> um, and there's, like, not enough, you know, you, you couldn't do that on that level, assuming that it is completely ethical so that everybody would be able to drink milk. And secondly, I wouldn't even want to drink it because of, you know, like, cancer and osteoporosis and, like, all of the other horrible things that it does. Like, why would I want to drink that anyway when right. there's right. so many other things like, you know, like rice milk and and hemp milk and like there's so many things that as far as I'm concerned like they taste you know pretty much the same except they don't have all of the like pus and you know like revolting things in them um, so like I just don't see the point anyway even if it was like why go to such lengths to make something that's unnecessary and unhealthy ethical like right right, right, um, right. great and, and yeah and I think with the eggs it's the same thing um, because now like I wouldn't want to eat eggs anyway um, and the other thing is um, about that is that um, I actually met somebody at, at like a neighbor from um, sort of the street um, the street over mine. We were, she has a dog, so I met her like walking our dogs, um, and she said that she grows um, chickens for eggs. And I was really fascinated because I'd heard about this on the internet, and I'd never met anyone who did it. And I said, um, "What like she she buys um, like the the eggs or the chicks, or somehow she like from this place and like fertilizes them?" And I said, "What happens to the male ones?" And she said, I have to cull them. And this is like my neighbor. This is just down the street. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so I was like, so that actually happens even on these like tiny. And she said, yeah, because, you know, like what can you do with them? Like this. The, and, and she said, um, if you um, like if you if you try to sell them places, often they'll like try to um, use them for like, um, I don't know, like chicken fights or in you know, like the, as bait for something. And so oh, they have yeah. lending. So so she's like yeah so I have to call them so so I thought like well then even that like you know even the backyard egg thing is not that's a, that yeah good. that's a great point that's a great point Your, people aren't going to keep the males and and then the other thing is the, the the feed the feed that they feed these chickens uh, who knows how that's produced and and yeah. what's in that so um, I think I, it, yeah this this thing I heard of how they they take animals that die in the animal production industry and then make feed out of the animals yes. and then feed it yeah. back. That is yeah. just, that. Oh my goodness. That's that's another huge issue is um, the whole like pet food industry. So um, when like when we went vegan, our our, our dog went vegan as well. Um, because yeah. Somehow, this is another thing. When I was vegetarian, somehow it never really occurred to me to question. I just thought like dogs eat meat, and you know we got him this 
um, you know, like sort of good quality, like organic, blah blah blah, um, like food with meat in it. Um, right. And then I and I didn't ever like giving it to him, but I just kind of felt like this is what you have to do if you have a dog. And then James said to me, he'd like he'd done some research and he said like dogs can be vegetarian. And I was like, really? And like, because that was another thing that had never occurred to me. And it's like, why not? Like, why isn't this more well known? People just assume like they must need meat, their dogs. And so we started looking into it because. After we were vegan, it like just seemed even more wrong. Like you know, after I'd seen the videos and the slaughterhouses, and I was like, it's like it's, I can't be vegan and then like buying all of these like slaughtered animals like to feed my dog, if you know, and if he doesn't even need meat, then it's really ridiculous. So, so our so we we switched um, our, our dog tails um, to um, being vegan, and then and then we uh, we adopted another dog, um, Panda. Um, so now we have two vegan dogs. And like they're fine, and like they're they are like thriving, and it's absolutely great, and like they have loads of energy, and you know, you know they, they do really well on it. I'm so glad you brought this up because I think um, uh, uh, you know people who aren't aware of these issues might say, "Oh, your dog's a carnivore. How can you do that?" So um, can you tell us, is there a uh, a vegan friendly uh, pet food that you found, and um, when when you do uh, turn the dog vegan? Do you try and give it, say, more protein than a human being? Tell us about that. Yeah. Okay. So it's really interesting. Um, we um, we've experimented with a few different brands of um, vegan pet food, and I think that the brands here are probably different than the ones that that you have in North America because I've seen like different ones referred to. I think there's one there called um, V Dog, which is um, kibble that we don't have here. But the ones um, that we use here, one is called Benevo, um, and it's just like it's it's in a tin. Um, and it really has a like kind of meaty like consistency and taste and like tails. Um, our first dog, who's extremely picky, um, he likes it. Um, and uh -huh. so we kind of like <laughs> that. We we sort of experimented until we found one that he liked. Um, and then we we're like, haha, one that he will eat. Um, and then um, panda will eat anything, so that's not a problem. Um, and then there are like um, um, there's like different types of kibble as well. Um, but um, we um, actually, um, our goal was to like to make them homemade food. So um, I've like kind of cracked the recipe now, and this is one of my greatest achievements. I'm very <laughs> proud of this. Um, it's um, there, there's some recipes on the internet for like vegan dog food, and they say like um, dogs are supposed to have more protein than humans. So they say like make it about like half um, like beans is the usual thing. They say like different kinds of beans. Um, okay. So there's like um, um, like kidney beans, butter beans, lentils. Um, brown rice, sweet potatoes, and um, broccoli or green beans and, and peas. Um, and so it's like, yeah, kind of like a mix of, I mean, like protein still, it still has a lot of like carbohydrates, but like kind of yeah. it's a mix of, um, you know, like kind of yellow and green vegetables and um, and like beans and rice or, or quinoa. Sometimes we use quinoa. Um, and then there's also a supplement that you can get, Veggie Dog, which um, has like, you know, kind of all of the sort of like minerals and things that they're supposed to need just in case that you can add in. Um, but so I, so they kind of have a mix, like they usually have that and then um, and Tails requires a dollop of Benevo, the tin food, because for some reason like he won't eat it unless it is this in this perfect arrangement <laughs> um, and like a bit of kibble. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> I think like that, yeah, that kind of covers everything but um, because like dogs are omnivores they're they're like humans like they, they, they don't they're not obligate carnivores like cats they don't actually require anything in meat so as long as they're getting a like kind of good mix of things it's it's all right and I was really surprised to learn that because you know you just assume that um, yeah that they're carnivores. but then actually thinking about it like I thought our dogs um, they're um, spaniels like Cavalier King Charles spaniels so like if you if you look at them they kind of seem like they have a I mean, I don't know how they evolved, but if it like if this makes sense based on how they evolved, but they kind of have a mix of of carnivore and non carnivore traits. So like they obviously they have carnivore teeth and you know like a carnivore um, digestive tract, but like their claws are not sharp. Like they couldn't catch something with their claws, and huh. like even it, and and they're also like when they see, and I, I think this is just somehow through how these domestic dogs have been bred, like because they haven't. I mean, like cavaliers anyway haven't been bred to you know like be attack dogs or anything. Right. Like if they, if they chase like things like if they chase a squirrel, like if a cat chases a you know like a bird or you know a mouse or something, like they will catch it and like kill it and eat it. But 
like our dogs, if they, they chase things, I think it's just somehow like a memory like that's imprinted. They don't even know why they're doing it. And if they catch one, like they would just be like, hello, play please. Like they wouldn't eat it. <laughs> so I just, I mean, I think, but I mean, that's just, that's just my non-scientific observation. Um, like they don't seem that carnivory to me. But aside from that, like it's, you know, demonstrated that like they definitely don't need to eat meat. Um, and yeah. the world's like oldest dogs were vegan. So... That's interesting. You know, that's an interesting point you're making because I do think a lot of domesticated dogs they have a, a kind of gentle character. Now, of course, mm -hmm. there's like there's like uh, Dobermans and pit bulls and uh, and and wolves. You know, wolves in the wild are definitely carnivorous. But yeah, definitely. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting point you're making. Um, okay, so, so uh, there's something I I want to ask you uh, and. It's sometimes I, I bring it into conversations. It's kind of this this uh, religious uh, spiritual aspect, and mm -hmm. I wonder um, I wonder if do you see a way that we can kind of bridge the gap between uh, people who have different religious perspectives? It's a, it's a huge question, hard to answer, but I <laughs> thought I would hear your your thoughts on it. Um, hmm, that's interesting. Well, I, I kind of think that um, people who are, like, I don't know, like, want there to be peace in the world, I guess, that's, those are, like, might be people coming from all different religious perspectives. And if they're sort of, like, looking for a way to do that, there are many, like, sort of different, you know, like, religious traditions that uh, sort of, suggest, you know, like that, I don't know, kind of improving the world, something like I mentioned, like the Jewish version is tikkun olam, like kind of improving the world, um, yeah. is possible. And so I think that like somehow trying to trying to promote um, like, you know, veganism and nonviolence would be eventually, and this is a very, very slow process, I, like I wish that it, that it could happen quickly, but I'm imagining that it will probably be a very long process. But I think that like if we can somehow highlight the importance of like nonviolence in all aspects of life starting with you know like an end to kind of cruelty to animals that that might make people more tolerant in other respects um, like kind of you know able to sort of accept each other's religious past because I think like so much of like sort of civilized human history is, is sort of based on the like exploitation of animals that I think that those things must be tied together because if you're like kind of regularly practicing like violence, then it's easier to imagine like kind of violence against other humans. And like so, I think if you, I don't know if this is what you meant, maybe I'm going off on a tangent. No, I, but, I, I love what I love what you're saying, and and a lot of people have said to me that uh, as as their consciousness of the value of animal life increased. It, there was a corresponding increase in respect for human life, and yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So that's kind of my hope because I think that um, if if somehow people are very like if you sort of like become an ethical vegan and you're really conscious about the fact that you don't want to participate in um, you know like cruelty to animals, then it, I just think logically it, it kind of has to follow that you will then be more conscious about not wanting to hurt other humans even if, you know, like, they have different views. Um, and I right. think that it, it, there was, um, um, I mean, lots of people have said similar things, but um, Isaac Bishop Singer, um, the Yiddish writer, so this is one that I like to mention, um, yeah. he said there, there will never be peace in the world as long as we eat animals. And I think, like, that kind of sums it up. So I think if you, if you want to, like, kind of... Um, you know, kind of find find a way for like different um, sort of like different religious groups and like different cultural groups to be able to coexist. That if everyone is kind of united by this shared principle of nonviolence, then it then it that that will just happen, or it will be much easier. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's something. This is this something occurred to me the other day, and and maybe you can give me your uh, opinion on this. Uh, there's there's a principle. Uh, tell me if I've got this right. Uh, so in in the Torah, when when you're using Hebrew to reference the name of God, uh, you don't 
keep the vowels because you don't want to have um, it, it's a it's a way of respecting the fact that you can't really use uh, uh, you can't use words to reference God. Is that is that accurate? Yeah. So um, yeah, in in Exodus, um, like God appears to Moses, right, the burning bush, and says, "I have this job for you." And uh, Moses is like, "I don't know. Um, like the people won't believe me. And how will I know? Like who you are? What can I tell them? Who can I say sent me?" And um, God says, um, tell them that Yod Hey Vav Hey sent you." Um, so Ayeshayeye means like, "I am what I am, or I will be what I will be," and yeah. it uses the same root. So like Hebrew has. Um, like three continental roots are kind of like the basis of the of the grammatical system. So, um, so yod hey vav hey, those four letters are from the same root as the verb to be. So, tell them that yod hey vav hey sent you is like something like we we don't know exactly what it means, but it must mean something like the one who is or the one who will be or something like that sent you. And so that's that's the name of God. Um, and because like Hebrew is consonantal only, so the vowel pointing was added later, and that was never pointed. And um, the, yeah, the idea is that the name is so sacred that nobody can utter it. Um, the only person who could say it was um, in the time when the, the temple existed in Jerusalem. Um, the high priest once a year on Yom Kippur could, would like go into the temple and would pronounce the name, and nobody else knew the name. And then the temple was destroyed. Um, and so since then, like, kind of nobody knows the name. Um, and, and so you see it printed, and it's always printed without vowels um, because, yeah, we don't know what it is. But um, they added on um, the vowels of another word, um, Adonai, which means my Lord. And so the combination of the consonants and those vowels, because it, usually in, um, in, like, recitation, if you were reading something, you, you would say, instead of, because we can't pronounce it, you'd say Adonai instead. So that's why they put those vowels on. And the resulting combination um, ends up with something that sounds like Yehovah, if you pronounce it. And that's what the English word Jehovah comes from. Um, so that's like a kind of an attempt to pronounce that name. But yeah, it, so in the Jewish tradition, you, you never say it. And um, usually, I, yeah. That is, this is fascinating to me. And it, it reminds me, you know, in, in Islam, there's this uh, notion that you can't represent God pictorially. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also um, a prayer in uh, in Hinduism. It's the Gayatri mantra, and there's a line in it which says um, it, it's a reference to kind of the nature of God. It says that from which all this derives. And mm -hmm. uh, I feel like all of these principles are similar in that you know we're trying to use we're trying to use language to kind of point to to God, but we can't really completely use language to describe God because, of course, God transcends all linguistic uh, parameters. So I just thought it was interesting that this, this theme manifests in different religions, and, but it's pretty much the same theme. Um, anyway, um, yeah. so uh, are there any, any like, if you, if you were to be talking to someone who was deciding to go vegan and uh, you had some tips to give them or even for, for long-termers, what, what would be some general tips you'd give, give someone? Um, I'd say if you're, if you're thinking about going vegan and you're not sure, I would say um, just, um, just do it because it will be amazing. <laughs> um, and like, kind of, don't worry. I, I mean, I'd say if you if you're worried about it, I guess um, you know, like, kind of, a nice thing is to say you'll just try it for um, like a week or two weeks or something that doesn't seem threatening, um, and see how it goes. Because, like, you know, I, I think that um, as long as you sort of make sure that you that you get things that you like to eat and you make sure that you have, um, you know, like, kind of enough. If you sort of like make a list of things that you like to eat um, that don't have animal products in them so that you kind of set up, um, you know, so that you don't kind of suddenly feel like, oh no, I'm stuck and I have no food to eat. Um, <laughs> and <Yeah>. um, <laughs> um, because I, I think maybe, I mean, I don't know, but I would imagine that that might be one of the reasons that, you know, people kind of think that it's too hard is because, you know, if, if sort of, if you just get rid of, rid of a lot of stuff and don't replace it with other things, then you might feel like you have nothing to eat. So I like, right, kind of just... Right. Yeah, like trying to plan ahead, thinking of things that you like, um, and um, 
what else? I guess um, I think I don't know. Another thing to to me that that seems sort of important is um, just to sort of find the right thing for you and not get too caught up in all of these different discussions. Like if you if you go on YouTube and you you know see all of the different wars between all of the factions, is to try not to pay too much attention to that and just you know like find something that you like. Um, and um, something else which like I wondered about and I didn't see anyone say anything about this so I thought like I'll just mention it is um, you do sometimes see people talk about it but um, is what to do with all of your like non-vegan stuff like leather and wool and things like that uh -huh. yeah um, because this was a problem that I had and like before right before we went vegan when we were thinking about it but I hadn't it hadn't really sunk in yet like what it meant um, I like bought these um, leather shoes, like these like uh, DMs, because I thought this will be my last chance to buy these because like soon I'm going to be vegan and I won't be able to. Which like now just seems ridiculous because like as soon as I went vegan I didn't want them anymore. <laughs> so I was like, well like why did I have to buy them? I don't want them. Like the whole idea is just gross. And what will I do with them? And so I don't think that there's a right or wrong answer here. Um and I guess I just wanted to say that because I was thinking like what should I do with them? Am I like kind of not really, you know, properly vegan because I still have this leather stuff? Um, and you know, like, should I save them because it's wasting it otherwise? Um, yeah, I love, you know, I, love, I, I love what you're saying. It's like, um, you know, the other day my sisters came up and cooked some food and they, they had made some rice cooked with butter. And it's like, am I going to throw it away? I hate to waste it. You know, it's, it's going to be, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a sin to waste, you know, but uh, on the other hand, it's not really healthy food, and, and of course, I don't ethically agree with you. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's difficult, yeah. So I've kind of come to the conclusion that, um, I mean, whatever you feel comfortable with is the thing to do, because, um, like, in cases like that, there's no, like, perfect solution. So in the end, um, I gave everything away to charity shops. Because then, and then I thought, mm, maybe that's not good either. Because then it's kind of like promoting, you know, like all of those things will be in the shops, and other people will buy them and wear them. <sighs> but because I've seen some people suggest that you should bury them, but then you have the whole like, first of all, it like is it practical to do that, and second, secondly, then they probably, you know, like if it's shoes, they have some like probably non-biodegradable elements in them, and so, so I don't think that there's a perfect answer, and there's no point in like going crazy trying to think of like all of the different ramifications, but um. But I think with things like that, um, I mean, if it's like, yeah, I think for me, if it's something like that, if it's food and you, you feel like it would be bad to waste it, but like, I think somehow the, you know, like sometimes people talk about how you sort of absorb the energy of the things that like go into you, and I would feel like I kind of somehow like I don't want to be any part of it, and I sort of felt felt the same with like the shoes, like every time I wore them, because I for the first few months I was still wearing the shoes, and every time I looked at them, like I would just kind of feel sick and like think I can't wait for these shoes to wear out so I can get rid of them. And then I thought like if I'm going to like feel sick every time I see my shoes, then like that's not good. So I might as well just get rid of them now and you know like not have to think about it anymore. And then you know at least somebody who needs the shoes will be able to have them and you know at least they're second hand and. So I think, I think it's great, Lily. I think it's great. Yeah, people are gonna people are gonna use these things anyway, and and why why waste it? Yeah, I I, I think that's the wisest choice. Yeah. But um, so yeah, and then uh, um, I guess and then I guess the only other tip is um is just to make sure that you eat enough, <laughs> because I think that that might be another reason why like some people sort of go back or like try veganism and then like um you know sort of go back to um, not being vegan um, is maybe that they don't like realize that you know because sometimes you hear people say oh like I, I I tried being vegan and then I just felt really weak and I think like because when we were first vegan I like I remember feeling like tired a lot and because I felt tired a lot before that it, you know I didn't it wasn't dramatic but like you know for the first couple of months I'm thinking like oh I really like feel low energy and because we were watching by then we started watching some videos like Happy Healthy Vegan and Really enjoying Rider and Forty Below Fruity and things like that. And so we're saying, like, do you think that we're not eating enough? <laughs> and then like we kind of tried eating more, and then like we had more energy. So um, I think that that might be an important thing because, um, like, because I think because we came to it ethically, there was no question of going back. Uh, but I think that often if maybe the people are trying it out and then they think, oh, this doesn't work. I feel really weak. You know, like I feel tired. Then they'll assume that it's because 
you know, like they're not getting enough protein or whatever, and then they'll like kind of go back to non-vegan diet. So if you just like, yeah, just just eat more food. <laughs> yeah, um, great, great point, great point. Uh, my friend Carlo has been making the point to me. He he feels that if people go to ve veganism for health reasons, it's not as strong a reason as uh, ethical. So so if if they're only concerned about health, that they might they might do, try veganism temporarily and then go back. And he's like, once you once you embrace and fully understand the ethical aspects, it, it's it's much less likely you're going to go back. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, definitely, because I think, what, like, once you've seen what's going on, there's just, like, no way that, you, you know, like, I think I think most people are, are compassionate and, you know, don't like to think that they're, you know, funding, like, torture and murder. So, like, surely once they know what's going on, they would just not want to have a part of that anymore. And then and then after that, you can kind of work out, you know, what the, the best, um, like, you know, the best diet or, like, whatever is for you. But you'll know that it's going to be something within, you know, like, kind of a vegan um, framework, absolutely. Because, uh, yeah, because otherwise, I I think that's maybe a lot of you see that happening a lot, kind of on YouTube with you know, like people saying like I tried this and it didn't work and I didn't like this and if it's like one specific regime and they're saying like you have to be you know, like I don't know, um, like the one that seems the hardest to me to follow is is like the fully raw. I mean maybe that's just me, but it just seems like that's quite a challenge for a lot of people. So, you know, like if you if you come to it that way and, and then you can't do that and you sort of have been told like this is the only good, you know, like this is like the only diet for humans and you can't do that, then you'll just be like, well, I couldn't do that, so like whatever, I can, you know, like go back to anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's 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 what I don't want to have happen. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I, I yeah. love what you said earlier. It's about there's so many opportunity options within veganism. I, I love I love that you highlighted that, and I think that's a huge way to get this message to the broader public. That's what I'm hoping. I re yeah, I really want to stress that as well. I guess for for like new people and people who are considering becoming vegan is that like there's so many ways to be vegan that you like you're bound to find one that you like, and um, I kind of personally think that um, all of the sort of the emphasis on health it's like good obviously because it's you know like it's it's really it's great that that veganism also often happens to be healthy but um, I would kind of like that to be like a secondary thing like you know like and um, another good benefit of being vegan is all of these like health benefits but uh, but like yeah to me it's somehow the the emphasis on health is is kind of detracting from the importance of it. I guess, or or maybe like of, of bringing more people over to it, um, because yeah. I think although I mean a lot of people come to it for health reasons and like that's great because then that gets them there and so it doesn't really matter how you get somewhere as long as you're there. Um, exactly. But yeah, this, exactly. this fear of people get kind of leaving it again. I think somehow, um, yeah, I I kind of that's what I'd like to do is try to kind of get find a way to get out the kind of the ethical message. Yeah, totally um, and. There's a whole other area which we haven't touched on much, and I'll just, in closing, ask you uh, if you can share with us some of the points you've uh, come across in this regard, and that is the environmental damage caused by the animal production industry. Oh, my goodness, yes, we didn't even mention that. And that, like, that was the other thing, um, because um, I'd known, you know, like, I think that, um, like factory farming was, was bad for the environment um, and you know, like pollution and water but it was very vague I hadn't really looked into it and so obviously then when you start looking at all these things you start find out about all of it and so like the whole thing of um, the like you know climate change and I think another saying like 51 percent of um, like climate change is estimated to be due to factory farming and so that was so horrifying and then like the water that it takes and like obviously like cutting down the rainforest and all of that it's just it's just like this is so bad for every inhabitant of this planet and for the planet itself in every way. <laughs> like you, you couldn't create something like more dangerous and horrible. <laughs> and like there's no downside to getting rid of it. So it's just like like my God, like why is this allowed to go on? <laughs> um, because the, the yeah, and, and it, it kind of and it's also interlinked that I think like somehow for me the, the environmental stuff isn't as like heartbreaking as the animal 
um, yeah. like cruelty side. So yeah. that's always the thing that is like kind of number one in my head when I think of it. But but the environmental stuff as well. It's like it's just that's huge. So um, I, but I I think that if if someone um. I mean, I, to me, I guess it's still. I think the the animal side is stronger because that's just like you know, if you see any footage from from slaughterhouses, like you know, or, like, you just like can't help but be like. I haven't even I haven't watched Earthlings because I I just I can't face it. Like because I can imagine what would be in it, and I feel once if I want to have seen it because it's it, you know sort of thing. It's like a rite of passage, and you should have seen it. And I've seen like kind of some you know other things and like clips, and I just. Like I mean, like yeah, I want yeah. to watch it. I I haven't I haven't watched the whole thing either, Lily. I I it's really hard for me. I I'll start crying, man. It, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, and and I think it's it's really important for people to see those things so that they know. But then like I'm kind of like I already know, and I don't know if I want to see any more of it. Um, but it's so upsetting that that like to me that's kind of the most important aspect of it. Like you know you. Even like sort of aside from the environment, like to me, that's kind of the strongest argument is like just so much horrific cruelty, um, like that has to stop. But then the the environmental reasons would be enough on their own as well, you know, like because all of this, you know, like talk about, you know, the, all of the other things that have to be done for climate change and like save water and like blah blah blah. But it's just all like a kind of drop in the ocean compared to this industry. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, it's great, great points you're making. I mean, and it's it's like once you once you see these three giant issues, health, ethics, and environment, it's amazing to me that you know this should be this should be just like standard education. Yeah, exactly. You know? This that's what that's what makes me so frustrated is um like I I don't watch the news and like I haven't watched the news like you know in ages because I just think it's it's pointless and it's a waste of time and you know like they're not they're not ever like reporting the things that they should report like this should be on the news <laughs> and yeah. um and i think until this is in like mainstream consciousness then like there's no point in you know whatever they're telling people to do and i think it's true I, like a lot of people have mentioned this that they they kind of give people things to do that are kind of manageable and like not that hard but like um salt is one thing so i know like salt is a controversial thing but um um, like McDougall says, and it kind of makes sense to me that like salt is a scapegoat, and it's just that salt, like all of the studies about salt, have, you know, that show that salt is is bad, is that it's a marker of these like kind of you know unhealthy um, circumstances, which are, are all like to do with the things that it is with, like because you don't like salt is never just tested in isolation, and I think that that makes sense. So that's just like one thing. People are told like reduce salt, reduce salt, but they're never like told reduce animal products or you know like cut out animal products. And and right. so they're kind of given this small project to do, which won't really make much of a difference, um, and kind of keeps the status quo as it is, or you know, like like being told to reduce water and like you know, like to remember to turn off the tap and like you know, like how much of a difference is that going to be made compared to the like you know the amount of water that's wasted in in factory farms? And that's never said. Like so, like to me, like the until they're going to actually get the real message out and tell people like this is serious you need to do this then like it's pointless you know like all, all of these like kind of tiny inconsequential things that people think that you know they must do and like that's really helping so that's very frustrating You still there? Yeah, are you there? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the so the last thing I want to wait a minute. All right, well maybe technology. There we go. There we go. Okay. All right, uh hopefully it'll let me get this last question in Lily. Um and thank you so much for all your time. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Oh no um, problem. This has been great. Thanks for having me. Uh, Tails yeah. will come to say hello. This is oh, Tails, the, Tails the vegan dog. All right. <laughs> um, so the question is, you know, now that you know what you know, how do you navigate society in a way that 
uh, allows you to, to, to visit loved ones, to, to be with family, to go to a, a social occasion. Uh, how, do you, how do you decide when to talk about these issues and when to remain silent? Um, how, how, do you, how do you live this way without alienating people? Um, how do you do it? It's really difficult. <laughs> um, and the thing that, that, that sort of makes me optimistic is um, I met someone um, recently who's been vegan for seven years and she said, um, like, you know, you just keep experimenting and eventually you get pretty good at convincing people to become vegan and, you know, like not offending them. So I thought, okay, there's hope because, like, I'm guaranteed to have lots of chances, you know, like for this, this um, topic to come up. So, um, um, in my kind of immediate everyday life, it's um, it's not it's not really a problem um, because sort of my the friends that the friends that I have like two of them are vegetarian um, and they like you know are kind of vegan friendly um, and one of them like you know I don't I don't really like sort of we don't go out to eat dinner at each other's like houses so it's not um, really a problem and then at, at university it's it's fine. You know, I, I like that term, Lily, uh, vegan friendly. I like that. <laughs> well, one of my friends, this was quite kind of one of the first um, sort of quandaries that I had was um, we're working on a project together. And so we were like, we were meeting. Um, and um, like before I was vegan, um, we sometimes like used to get um, like coffee for each other. So like, you know, she, like she would bring two lattes or something or I would bring two lattes. And so, so... <sighs> I asked her um, um, if if um, she wanted coffee on the way, and she said yes. And then I thought, like, oh my god, I really like I don't want to buy coffee with milk. So I just bought two soy lattes and brought them. And I was like, mm, what will I say? And um, so I said to her, like, hey, here you are. Uh, you have either one. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, which which one has normal milk in it? And I said. Um, Neither, because like since I found out how cruel it is, I can't buy milk anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, and she was like, "That's okay. I, like I, I've had soy milk before. I'll have the soy milk." So I was like, "Oh, that went well," because I like I was really really nervous. And and then I thought like, "Okay, like if somebody asked, this was the next thing I was worried about. Like at work, if you know, like if if I was going to the like cafeteria or something, I you know would say, "Do you want me to bring anything back for you?" Um, and this is another thing that, like, when I was a vegetarian, I, like, I didn't mind if somebody asked me, like, can you bring back, you know, like, something with meat in it. I, like, I didn't really think about it. And now, like, I was just like, I, I can't, like, I don't want to give money for those things, even if it's not for me. Like, I just, you know, like, it, it kind of feels like it would be condoning it. Um, yeah. I can, so, I can relate, Lily, and, and I'm in a situation where I, I care for my mom, and, uh -huh. I have, and I have to cook meat for her and oh it's really it's, difficult it, it's really a drag it's really a drag yeah oh I really sympathize that's yeah. it's, that's really tough so I think yeah so far I've just kind of avoided that situation but I know that except for that one time um, but yeah I know that that's going to happen again so I'm kind of nervous about how to handle it and you know I'm I think I'll just say something like I'm, I'm really sorry like I um, like I, I, you know, like I can't buy meat anymore. Is there something else that I could get, or, or something like so that it's not doesn't cause offense? But like I really, yeah, I, I really I respect that. That's that's awesome. I love that. I mean, my my hope is that that will somehow, if I can do it in a way that doesn't annoy people, <laughs> which will be the challenge. But um, you know, like if I can do it in a way that seems somehow like you know inoffensive, that it might do something to make people think like, oh, you know, like it. I, I don't know. It's like something that I kind of want to take a stand on. Um, and then yeah. in terms of the family, like my mom obviously is fine because when I when I, I told her that we've gone vegan and I was really excited about it, she said, "Oh, I thought you were already vegan anyway." <laughs> and I was like, "No, I'm a vegetarian." And she was like, "Oh, okay." And <laughs> so um, that's fine. Um, but going to visit James's family, which we we haven't done since since we've been vegan, I think that that's going to be a challenge because it was already enough of um, enough of an issue. And he he'll tell you more about this, but you know, like when we were vegetarian um, and we were going to visit them, like his dad's wife wanted to know what to get us, and like and like James's dad was like, "Fish, that's okay, isn't it?" And James is like, no, fish isn't a vegetable. <laughs> and um, so then, and we saw them actually right before we we went vegan when we were thinking about it. And and I said to James's dad's wife that we were thinking of going vegan, and she was like, so what? You wouldn't eat, eat like 
porn anymore because um that was like their staple you know porn Q U R N it's yes. a brand yeah, of yeah, like yeah. you know like um and it, it has eggs in it. So that used to be like one of our staples before we became vegan, which is another benefit of becoming vegan is that like we gave that up because it's not like it's processed and it's not very good. Um yeah. and um so she so like she was just like completely baffled by the concept that like she, and you're just like but what we eat and um so hopefully the next time we go there we'll be like kind of prepared and well I mean we'll have to be but you know we'll have to like kind of explain um and I think right. that will be like more more of a challenge um because I think that like they thought well like they don't eat meat but this there's this meat substitute which kind of looks like meat and so like they always just made us corn things and so now and so now she's like you don't even eat corn like what what do you eat now <laughs> um, so yeah and yeah, then um, you know, yeah yeah it's like I I always I don't want people to have to go to a lot of trouble and you can you can usually have something that's not meat you know they there's usually salad or something you know so. That's the thing is like, yeah, it's like it's so simple. And I think often as well, like I've I've had this reaction from people like saying, Oh, but like to like cooking vegan food would be so complicated, it would take so much time. And I was like, but why? It's so simple. It's like you can have it be as simple as you want. I mean, because, I, yeah, I'm thinking of just saying to them, like, just you know, get us some bananas and potatoes and yeah. <laughs> we'll be yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, so um and I and I think then like, you know, that they'll be like, but that like they won't I think that they wouldn't compute that as food. Just like twenty bananas, <laughs> you know, like and like you know, giant bag of potatoes. <laughs> we'll, we'll be okay. Um, so, but I kind of like, um, in some ways, I look forward to things like that because I I like to kind of have the opportunity to show people that like have never been exposed to anything like that before that it's really fine and um, you know it's it's not difficult and it's not a problem and. Um, Somehow, like maybe, kind of, you know, a little bit raise awareness that way. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely. All right, yeah. Lily, man, we we've covered so much. Thank you. You're awesome, awesome uh, rep representative of veganism. So, so thanks for taking the time. Oh, thank you so much. And and I do. I hope you'll do some of your own videos. Would love to see that. And um, I look forward to talking to James. And yeah. If if you're ever up for it, maybe we'll do a couple months down the line. We we'll do a follow up or something. Yeah, that would be great. No, this is really exciting. And like I said, because I've been watching these interviews for so long, it just seems kind of like it's like a dream to come true to like take part in one. It's really exciting. So, thank well, you. It's really fun, and you're you're just a fountain of information. So thank you. Thanks, and thanks for doing this because I think these interviews are such a great resource. And um, I think you mentioned in in one of them that um, you thought that people like to have shorter videos, but I really like the long videos. So. Thank you. Yeah, I keep doing it now because I think it's really nice to have something like kind of like nice and you know satisfying to listen to, and it's great getting to hear people's stories and seeing how many like different types of vegans there are and how they came to it. So it's really like really valuable. All right, thank you so much, okay. Lo. Thanks so much. Bye. Take care. You too.